And I want to um, introduce you today to our guest speaker, Pamela Vatican. Hi. And there she is. And Pamela is a board member of the Center for Home Movies. Um, she's also part of the Community Archives Workshop Collaborative. Um, and uh, for her day job, <laughs> She is manager of the California Revealed Project, which um, she'll tell you about a few of these organizations and projects today. But in particular, we're going to be focusing on home movies. Um, so uh, just to kind of set up today and how we're going to do it, we're probably going to use all of our like hour and a half that we um, blocked out. Uh, so especially since um, we haven't had one-on-one uh, -on -one check-ins with everyone, it seemed like there was a lot going on this month. So I want to make sure that we have time for um, any questions and specifics. So we're going to have Pamela start off, and then um, we are, and then I'll take, and then we'll do a Q and A with Pamela, and then I will um, take over and. Uh, give you the class that I am going to give to you guys um, to take to your patrons for preserving home movies. So, um, without further ado, here is Pamela. Pamela, you're you have your screen shared, right? Yeah. And can everyone hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Great. Hi, everybody. Um, this is the first time I've ever done a chat presentation like this, so it's this is exciting. Um, and thank you, Siobhan, for having me. Um, we've been watching um, the Memory Lab network come together, and I'm really excited that there are two in California. Um, and we recently got some funding from the State Library to set up a Memory Lab in the Bay Area to kind of bridge the two that are in northern, you know, north northern California and then southern California. So. I'm really happy to meet you all, and I would love to continue to learn from you as you're setting your labs up. So thank you for having me. Um, I wanted to, um, well, I'm wearing a couple of different hats today. Um, mostly I'm coming from um, the Center for Home Movies, which is the volunteer work that I do. Um, I've been doing Home Movie Day for um, at least 10 years. Um, here in the Bay Area, and um, that's really what I wanted to talk about, but it is related to my 9 to 5 work with California Revealed. Um, it's all related, um, basically, because <laughs> California Revealed is um, a statewide project. We're funded mostly, primarily now, by the State Library, but we've, we've gotten some IMLS funding, NEH funding, throughout the years, but since 2010, We've focused on preserving, digitizing, preserving, making accessible audiovisual collections across the state from libraries, archives, museums, um, historical societies. And we focused on AV because, um, because AV is obviously endangered. Um, but, obvious, but we also felt like there was a real lack of um, this content being available um, for study. Um, research, um, enjoyment, and we've done a lot of home movies over the years. So um, home movies are actually my favorite, I think, <laughs> of what we've preserved because they are just m such intimate, real portraits of people just living their lives, you know, unmediated. Um, and it's it's usually so candid, too, and there's always surprises. Um, so I, I'm always sniffing out home movies, and I'm so happy that we've preserved as many as we have. Um, I wanted to point you all to California Light and Sound at Work. That's our website where you can see everything that we've done so far. We started off as an audiovisual preservation project, but now we are digitizing all formats, and we're now called um, California Revealed. We were called the California Audiovisual Preservation Project, which some of you may have heard of before. Um, and I know LAPL, they've, they're um, partnering with us now to digitize some newspapers with us. So 
um, the network is, we have lots of networking happening here, um, which is wonderful. So, um, so California revealed, um, we now have over 200 partner archives, libraries, and museums across the state, and over um, 18,000 objects. So we've, we've done, um, we concentrate on mostly unique, unpublished, you know, archival material, primary sources, you know, like one of a kind, home movies. Um, and it really is, um, we think, much more exciting than a textbook um, to, to work with these primary documents. Um, we work primarily with nonprofit organizations, um, and we know that they're missing stories. And what I what I struggle with is um, trying to find like you know the personal history. So um, like the home movie collections that are in people's closets. So you know we can only work with organizations. So we rely on our partners to find those communities and work with the individuals to bring that those materials in. And we have several partnerships in that regard that have worked out well. And that's why I think the memory lab model is really exciting because I think it's, a, it's kind of an extension of that where you have you provide the space for people to come and share their history. Um, and what I find exciting is, um, you know, working with those individuals, you know, they know, they know their history best, they know what it is, they can help with, you know, the metadata, the context. Um, you know, that's a lot, we struggle with that working with institutions that have, you know, these organ collections, there's only so much information we have. So um, we have several partnerships, like with um, Ontario Public Library's History Room, African American Library and Museum at Oakland, Eastern California Museum, and then the Center for Asian American Media's Project Memories to Light. We have set up partnerships where they have an open call for content and people bring in their home movies, um, personal papers, whatever, scan them you know, at the institution. We get the files, we put them online, we back them up, um, you know, we provide the, the access point, and then the originals and copies of the files go back to the families. So um, it's kind of like, um, I think it will work well with, with, um, with the Memory Lab Network. I mean, I'm really hoping um, California Revealed can partner with the California folks, um, you know, if we can provide pre preservation online access, we would love to, to partner with you. And as I mentioned, we're hoping to set one up here in the Bay. Um, I didn't mention this where I am. I'm, I'm in San Francisco, but the project space at the State Library in Sacramento. So we're Bay Area based. So for today, I wanted to talk a little bit about our partnership specifically with the Center for Asian American Media. Um, I don't know if, if any of you have heard of Memories to Light, this project. Um, and the partnership for me goes back many years, and I don't even know, I was trying to think for this, for this presentation today, I was trying to think when I first started working with CAM. I can't even remember, I don't know if it was part of my day job or part of my home movie day work, I don't remember, but we've um, we've done several presentations with them um, as part of home movie day, and we've also um, we're also now providing you know long term preservation and, and access online access to the files that they're now um, creating. So Memories to Light is a very specific home movie project where CAM works with individuals to digitize their home movies. They actually have their own film scanner at CAM. Um, they're based in San Francisco. So the families bring in their collections. Um, and specifically, it is, um, it's an effort to, um, you know, preserve the Asian American experience. Um, I just have to quote the director of CAM, Stephen Gong. I think he has kind of the best senses of this, um, but they started the project recognizing the fact that Asian Americans are largely absent from mainstream American media, at least in terms of authentic images as opposed to stereotypes. And this is especially true for the decades in which home movies flourished, like 1930s through the 1970s. So he says, fundamentally, a project like this reminds us that every family story matters and that we are all enriched in the sharing. And what I love about this project specifically is not just the connection that they have with the Asian American community, but they do all these really wonderful events. 
Um, they've done home movie days um, almost almost every year, like off and on. And they also um, do these wonderful programs where they commission um, artists, documentary filmmakers to re you know work with the footage, rework you know maybe accompany it with music or there's some sort of narrative. Um, I've, I've been to a couple of events that are that are always kind of different. But they're usually um, part of the Center for Asian American Media Film Festival that they do every year. So, um, and then I think they're also showing programs on um, Xfinity. Like they have some sort of connection with um, the ca that cable network. So they're they have um, so they're getting the content out there. Um, they're getting people talking about it, and um, I think that's that's a wonderful model. So I just wanted to point you to this. This is where home movies live at the Internet Archive. This particular collection is part of California Revealed. So I just that so that specifically that's Cal, those are California home movies, but Memories to Light, they're interested in the Asian American experience worldwide. So um, so their their collection actually extends beyond this particular collection, but I just wanted to try to keep it close to home. So I do encourage you all to to look at those. Um, so I wanted to just kind of launch into what we've done with CAM um, specifically, um, just kind of talking about how to host a home movie day um, and just kind of the basics of what you need. Um, I mean, I I enjoyed working with CAM because they had they had the built the community was built in, and um, I'll talk about that at the end about the community because I think every, that's different for everybody. Um, but for us here in the Bay, um, we've focused mostly on the East Bay because I knew, you know, living here in San Francisco, um, the San Francisco Media Archive, they always do a home movie day in San Francisco. So I just focused on the East Bay because I was working over there. So it just seemed easier um, to keep the community kind of small, I think, actually works the best. Um, but I think it helps. That, to think about kind of your your local partnerships. Um, so I started with CAM because that seemed kind of the, the best example of someone who had the community already built in. Because I want you all to think about your existing resources because you'll see as we go through this that of course there's a lot you have to bring, um, but then there's you just you have to think about kind of the tools and resources you already have. Um, and I think some of you probably already have home movie day communities. Um, that you just need to connect with. And I'm happy to help after this. Um, and Siobhan knows people too. Um, there's, there's a network already here that we can plug into, which is a wonderful thing about Home Movie Day. So um, I think Home Movie Day has been happening since maybe 2002, 2001, something like that. Um, it was founded by the, um, the Center for Home Movies, which is like a kind of a it's not a real place. It's really just a group of archivists who are concerned about preserving um, home movie um, home movies and keeping them with the families, which I think is is an important thing to note. Is of course you can connect people with collecting institutions, but really we're trying to teach home movie care so that the, the films last, so that they stay close to home um, where they should be. Um, of course. Digitizing the home movies for access, you know, sharing them online, making DVDs, um, all of that is important, but you still want to hold on to the film because, as we know, digital files are vulnerable, this can get scratched, um, and there's always um, the inevitability that we may need to retransfer the film. So that's really like the most kind of important thing um, to know because that's kind of part of the mission of Home Movie Day is to to teach basic collection care. And what's wonderful, of course, about the experience is seeing the film as film, projecting the film as it's meant to be projected, meant to be seen. And usually home movie days are very intimate, like a living room setting, which I've always enjoyed, um, just kind of recreating that experience, which has also been lost, I think. Um, but I do want to say, you know, as I'm getting into kind of, this is very kind of film, Centric, but there's lots of home video, there's lots of digital video, and I know um, 
there are so many different models for home movie day. Um, this is maybe a more traditional approach, um, but I think there's a lot of flexibility in how you want to define that because it's really just about celebrating home movies, sharing home movies, and teaching like basic home movie care. So, and it's about building a community, of course. So, what do you need? You need space. <laughs> and this is an example of a little, uh, this is like a, we did this with the Center for Asian American Media. We partnered with Mills College. They had an exhibit um, on Korean American art and they wanted to do a home movie day specifically for Korean Americans. So we came in um, and we brought kind of the tools and the equipment. But Mills provided the space, they provided the theater. Um, but you could really just honestly project on the wall. You don't really need that much in terms of space. You don't need a lot of space. And I know some people lately have even done home movie days like in their house, you know. Um, it's, it's really, there really is no model, but you obviously do need a place um, for people to gather, you know. I mean, if, I don't know if anyone else here has gone to a home movie day, but I'm sure you've you've had different experiences. Um, for me, like I, we've had maybe five people come and then we've had 50 people come. So it's really, it's kind of, um, yeah, it's, it just depends on the community and where you are. So um, I think keeping it small and simple is probably the easiest approach. Um, you know, you do need chairs, of course, but you maybe only need 15 chairs. So just, you know, you can start small. What else do you need? So this is a big thing, equipment and supplies. Um, we've always, you know, provided support for 16 millimeter, regular 8 millimeter, super 8 millimeter. Um, but of course, you know, if you want to accommodate video, you have to have those decks on hand. Um, some people bring in monitors um, and, a, you know, a projector. I know folks have just shown, you know, DVDs or files, you know, maybe you just need like a laptop and a projector, um, that, that'll that work too. It's it's not, it doesn't have to be like necessarily film that we're showing, but um, you do have to kind of consider what your boundaries are. Um, we've actually never gone, we've never shown video ourselves, but we're now going to try that this year. So it's, um, it is like an extra complication to try to like accommodate every single format you Go, but um, but yeah, you just have to kind of think. Well, what what can you handle? Um, and then of course you have to think about okay, <laughs> who's going to be helping me here? Because I'm sure most of you are like one or two people on staff. Um, we've kind of built up a network of volunteers, and we actually just started training um, folks and kind of renewing that training every year to bring in new people um, because at this point, you know, we've done a 10, 10 years of home movie days and we've done several home movie days in one year. So, you know, I don't mean to like wear people out and of course I want our community to grow. So I was, you know, I'd encourage you to think about maybe ways to maybe set up a training, you know, at your um, memory lab, kind of to bring people in, teach basic film handling, you know, tapping into your existing network of archivists, film archivists, video archivists, people who already are there in your community to kind of help bring together the supplies and the people. Because um, I think what I found is like once you bring people together, they they, they get hooked, honestly. Home Movie Day is really fun. It's really fun. So people, people love it. And you can see, look how smiley our projectionists are. They're so excited to be cleaning projectors. <laughs> um, yeah, I actually, I didn't put a slide in here about like how to make volunteers happy, but I think, you know, giving them space, you know, I've, I've always encouraged people if they want to program something, they can. Um, snacks, you know, there's like incentives here, you know, um, but usually people are, like, once they get in, it's like, they keep coming back every year. So of course, what do you need? You need films to show or video and video. Um, and you need to bring the people in. So um, this is this has been something that I a challenge for for the Bay Area because there is like a lot going on and traditionally home movie day happens in October, um, which can be a busy time. But we've actually started moving home 
home movie day around because home movie day is every day. And um, it actually offers us more flexibility um, to do it in different venues, different neighborhoods. Um, to kind of, I think being a Rolling Stone could actually be advantageous, but then also, you know, if you want to build that community, it's easier just to keep um, coming back to the same place, maybe. Um, so things to think about. Um, also thinking about like existing partnerships too, like um, if you want to go somewhere else, um, that that other place, if you want to like bring in an, another library, if you want to move around, um, you have to think about like who who's part of that community, um, kind of keep people connected could be a challenge. Um, but yeah, you need you need films to show and videos. So um, what we usually do is we put a call out, you know, outreach is very important. I can't um, overemphasize that is just kind of getting the word out as soon as you know when you're going to be having the event. Um, for those of you who may not be too you know, showing film as film, um, you might want to build into your schedule, your timeline, you know, digitization, so prepping the film and just then having a video file to show, you know, that might be a little bit easier um, and less pressure for you. So that means getting the call out, you know, sooner, or it could be an ongoing call, which is what we, you know, we do with um, CAM, with the Center for Asian American Media. We, they're always accepting home movies and we're always excited to partner with them and show whatever they have. So, um, yeah, just kind of get the word out. Um, HomeMovieDay.com is a wonderful resource. Um, so I was going to talk about that a little bit. Um, but once you know that you're going to be doing a Home Movie Day, please let the Home Movies know. Um, there is a listserv you can join. Um, there's a community there that exists, um, it's a good community of Home Movie Day people. And then you can also ask them, too, about strategies for outreach and getting the word out. Um, because you definitely need people. You need people to come and bring the, the, bring the films. You want an audience. And I found that, um, you know, people will come without home movies. They just want to see the home movies. They care about their local history. Um, and the wonderful thing about it is, you know, depending on how you want to do it, um, kind of the traditional format is showing the film and allowing people to talk, ask questions, you know, laugh, cry, and maybe show music or um, accompany music with, with it, maybe like at a low volume. Um, everyone kind of has a different style, um, and you can kind of gauge that based on, on your own community. There's, there's also all sorts of different games you can play, like home movie um, bingo. <laughs> home movie day bingo is, is something some people play. There's like raffle prizes you can do. Um, but I think it really just depends on your own, your own community. Um, I've, I found that sometimes people can be rather shy. So as a host, you have to be kind of ready to kind of fill in the blanks and kind of ask questions yourself or kind of get people talking. There's always opportunities to talk about home movie care, um, just to always constantly plug that and um, talk about why it's important to save home movies and what basic steps people can do to ensure that they, they survive. And one other consideration too um, is just think about what else you could do besides just showing home movies. Um, we've done some, we've had partnerships with us at the Oakland Museum of California where we um, we showed um, home movies from the African American Museum and Library at Oakland with live jazz accompaniment from, um, this is Marcus Shelby's band. He's a, a local jazz musician, really wonderful musician. Um, and he just, you know, the, the museum commissioned him to, to do this work. So um, I hesitate to, to bring in, oh, you need, you know, special programming, you know, funding or something to, to make this happen. I mean, of course, there's probably talented musicians in your communities maybe, you know, willing to, to play for free. Um, but it's, I think that it's, it's enjoyable for them and provide, um, we've, we've had that happen too. We've had like, you know, like, improvised organ accompaniment at um, the Internet Archive, which is like a former Christian scientist church. So we've we've kind of just brought in whatever, you know, elements that already exist. We're like, oh, let's just use the organist there. So um, 
Yeah, I just I, I wanted you to consider that because it, it can be a draw for audiences. Um, I think it has worked well to have kind of this open screening format and then followed by something that's more curated um, that you could have, you know, have prepared in advance to kind of draw people in and kind of have this open door kind of people can come and go. But in the end, so like we'll all gather together around this particular performance or screening. Um, I think that's worked well um, here. And I would just encourage you all to think about existing curators, um, artists, people who are already in your community who would be interested in putting something together with you um, so that you're not, you know, stretching anyone too thin. So um, last, I just wanted to plug, you know, homemovieday.com. This is really the one-stop shop to do your own home movie day. It has all the information you could possibly need. Um, home Movie Day is coming up October 20th. Officially, it's October 20th. That's when folks, you know, all over the world will be celebrating home movies. But Home Movie Day is really every day, can be every day. So don't feel tied to that date. Um, and and please, you know, contact us. Um, you can either contact me or anyone on the board. There's a general email address that you can email to get on the list. And we also can set up a site for you, like you can have your own um, page for your event. But here is really where, because I know we don't have a lot of time today, but I just, this is really all the kind of the nitty gritty. There's like frequently asked questions. There's like a checklist for supplies. Um, you know, just everything you could possibly think of is, is here. Um, but we're here to support you. The Center for Home Movies really is here to support you. So if there is something you don't see, um, please let us know. Most of the resources we have here are for film care. And this year, we're trying to expand that to include video care um, and also digital preservation tips because we know people have these files and what are people doing with the files? You know, what are people doing with home movies on their phones? What are people doing? So. We would like to provide um, those resources to um, this next year. That's kind of one of our goals this year. So, yeah, that's like as quickly as I could go because I did want to leave question, you know, time for questions. Um, I would love to hear if any of you out there have already done home movie days um, or if you have ideas like how to like make, you know, based on your experience, what makes a successful home movie day. Um, but do keep in touch and email me or call. Um, these are, I would love to hear from you. Awesome. Thank you, Pamela. You're welcome. Um, yeah, I feel like I, I have to say, I know focusing on the, um, the website is, is an amazing resource. So the, the class that I put together today, I essentially just like pulled so much of it from um, from their website. Other stuff that's on there, like they have awesome graphics you can that that you can like take um, and then you know just plaster your own inform your own library's information or wherever you're having your home movie day. Um, you can use the graphic for something else too. I mean, like they just have some cool imagery, um, videos even that you could use to promote stuff. Um, like just all kinds of stuff. Uh, is, and the Home Movie Day bingo sheet is on the website too, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Um, and that's like, I have to, I have to like explain what that, so, and it, I love the Home Movie Day bingo because it's like, it, it really drives it home like that we all sort of have, um, you know, there are differences in, in home movies and different cultures and different regions. But then there are so many similarities. So, there, and, and that's sort of what the whole movie day bingo gets across. Like, um, but what are some of the ones on, on there, Pamela? Like, uh, you know, um, birthday, opening birthday presents. It's like waving at the camera. Yep, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, dogs. just, what was that one? <laughs> dogs. Dogs, right? Dogs or cats, family pets. Um, yeah, so it's a baby, bathing a baby in a sink or something like that. 
there are some um, very specific ones. And then I always say that there's like for regions too, like for Maryland, every time we have a home movie day, we have, um, it's always sailboats, uh, sailboating, uh, horses, and eating crap. Like those uh -huh. are our three, everyone's like, oh, we gotta get the camera out. It's yeah. time to take, take some video of this or film of this. So, um, so that, that's why I really wanted to point out the bingo. It's, and I cannot um, it's say enough how much fun Home Movie Day is. Uh, it's always like, for me, we always, there aren't as many, there aren't that many like AV archivists in the Baltimore area. Mm. Um, and so there's like three of us. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, um, so I feel like every year we're always kind of like throwing it together. October is a busy time. Um, so we're always like stressed about it. I'm like, uh, and then we have so much fun. It's yeah. just so much fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, it's hard to just be like, ah, homo some people, I even like tell them about it and they're like, okay, that sounds interesting. And, and like, they actually think it sounds really boring to watch someone else's home movies, but it's really not. Um, so what we did last year here was we actually, we had one venue and then that venue didn't work out like the week before, unfortunately. Oh, no. Yeah. And so we just got this other venue that's literally right across the street from here. And it has like a built in experimental film artsy fartsy crowd that I love. Um, but uh, so this was a little bit of a stretch for them, but the fact that we were showing film and they do like to show film, um, and they're just supportive of, of community, you know, of other community partnerships and things like that. Um, and we had a decent turnout, you know, even though it was, we didn't have a lot of time of doing any press or anything. And then it just turned out just because we had it at this venue, that, um, uh, an editor, the editor of the local magazine just happened to come because he likes to go there and just goes, just because he trusts their like curating and programming. And then got an article in the local magazine about it. Awesome. Yeah, so, and hopefully he'll come out to the next one. Yeah. So that's where the partnerships are pretty key. Even if you guys don't do a home movie day at your library, which I've done one or two at a public library during the day kind of thing, and that was fine. I personally prefer my, to do like a home movie night where mm -hmm. there is also alcohol, because then it, people so much less shy, but you know, the neither here nor there, whatever you're into. Um, but I feel like, so there are a lot of different options. There's no, you know, you can have it at a bar, you can have it at a public library, this or that. You can have it in someone's house. You can have it in a big theater too. Um, so the main thing, the main thing, and then like Pamela said, you can show film, you can, uh, the, the way I would recommend starting off for you guys, would unless you're Kurt, because Kurt used to be a projectionist, so Kurt has the <laughs> Kurt gets <laughs> to be out of the way. Um, but I, I recommend because I am definitely not. I don't feel comfortable like projecting at this point in my. I just not there yet. Today I'll feel I'll feel that way. But like you know, so if you don't have the training, if if you don't have anybody there, maybe this is a great time for you guys to put a call out to the people who are using your memory lab and say, hey, do you have any fun files that you found, you know, anything that you found while you're using the memory lab and you want to submit it? And so you can kind of curate it before. Um, and that's kind of what we do with Baltimore since we don't have a lot of time or a lot of equipment. We curate things before so we know that we at least have a certain amount of stuff that we can show because a lot of people that come don't actually bring stuff. So that's one of the things that Home Movie Day, a lot of times people – just bring stuff that day and they haven't seen it in years because they don't have the projector to view it, you know? So it's sort of like, so it's a big surprise to everyone what it is or what it could be. Um, and then there are a lot of those surprises like, oh my gosh, that's my grandfather or, you know, et cetera, my dog that I miss. Um, so yeah, that, that was, those were just some things I wanted to mention about Home Movie Day. My, my experiences with Home Movie Day, with most of, most of the time, it's very, uh, um, I want to say it's a little slapdash, but we always have so much fun. Um, and the community loves it. They're mostly surprised at how much they love it. 
And then, um, and all my friends that I make come, love it. Yeah. <laughs> and then also, so what I'm thinking too, if you guys don't feel comfortable having your home, own home movie day this year, you know, just if you want to do the class that I'm going to share with you guys and either tie it in with the, with the people who are in your area, if you have any who are doing a home movie day, um, and, and then go to their home movie day and maybe promote your class that you're going to be teaching. Um, just kind of do a back and forth and then may, or if you do your class first, maybe you can promote their home movie day. Um, so just thinking about tying in a class or something like that to, uh, and obviously the memory, as you'll see when I get into my presentation, the memory lab is um, just such a great segue uh, to home movie day and vice versa. Cool. Any other, any questions for Pamela about having a home movie day? I saw one. Ooh, I saw a chat question. Um, what Pueblo Library asks, what is the typical venue for home movie days? I've seen them advertised as events at bars. Have you seen done that before? So, yeah. Go yeah, ahead, Pamela. Yeah. Go away. Well, I love the idea of staying in at a bar that we've never done that because we've been more like family oriented. Um, well, I usually have to bring my own kids, so. <laughs> um, but I, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's really there aren't any rules. I, for us, so I started doing home movie day at Pacific Film Archive where I used to work um, as the collection assistant. And so that was part of their like, you know, their film program and it was in like a film theater. And you know we had to we brought the the projectors into the into the audience you know like between the seats you know so it wasn't like I think that's actually a really important part of home movie day is the mechanical you know seeing like the mechanics behind showing the home movies like pe and inspecting like people really love seeing that and hearing the projector like recreating that experience so that was kind of an interesting thing because Pacific Film Archive they're like a museum you know they're part of the Berkeley Art Museum so their projectors are usually up in the booth and they're totally, you know, you can't even see them. And it was really this sort of supposed to be kind of like cinema as a seamless experience, um, which is not what home movie day is about at all. You know, it's, we really want to see the splices and, um, you know, appreciate film as, you know, the material of film or, or video, whatever, maybe. Um, so that's where we started. And then when I left PSA, that's when I started. Honestly, I felt like a rolling stone, but I think it's been challenging, but fun in a way to kind of see how to configure Home Movie Day in these different spaces. So we've done them, you know, most of the pictures I showed today are from the Berkeley Public Library. They have like a community room, um, you know, that we've used there a couple of times. Um, in Oakland, we did, um, we used like an art center, the Temescal Art Center, which is a very raw, I think it's usually like a dance studio during the week. Um, it's a very raw space, so we would just bring everything in. Um, the Asian, let's see, the, with Cam, we did um, presentations at the Chinese Historical Society, Chinese American Historical Society in San Francisco the um, Oakland Asian Cultural Center, which is like part of the Oakland Public Library. So, um, you know, these are usually community spaces, but that's not to say you couldn't, I mean, you could do it outside. I mean, I, I think there's, the, the logistics are you need electricity. <laughs> so that's like a basic thing and you need to like block out light. And so when Siobhan mentioned the bar, a night, you know, event at a bar, that's, that's perfect. You don't have to block out light. Um, so it's just like a different kind of experience. So I, I don't think there's any like, I mean, I think if you look, if you go to homemovieday.com and you look, there's lists right there, um, Home Movie Day of locations, you can see that it's kind of all over the place where, where people host home movies. I mean, I think it's very, it's very open. And it's international, right? International. Yeah, there's like 10 in Japan, I think. Right. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Kurt had a great question, which was, how do you like? What kind of disclaimer do you say to people that their that their film might get damaged? Because he said that he saw that happen at USC once, where film oh. got on the gate. Right. Well, so a big part of the process is um, you know having people inspect the films before you know we project them. Um, it's actually really, really important to, you know, minimize the risk of damage. Um, we've, I mean, 
that's like the last thing we want to happen <laughs> is damage of film because these films are unique um, and irreplaceable. So part of the process is setting up these inspection, you know, stations. So um, and that is part of the list of supplies that you that you need. Um, and you can you can find these on eBay. You, you know, I'm sure they they exist in your in your towns. Um, and I'm happy to help connect you with people that might have this equipment too. Um, so that's the first thing is really like making sure that the film is in good condition enough to get through the projector. Um, so I mean, real quick, real quick, um, is that list part of like the list that you mentioned on the on the website? Yeah, yeah, it's like a, there's a checklist. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, including like white gloves, which people love to see, you know, we're taking special care of, of their, you know, home movies, their precious home movies. Um, so we check, you know, we check every single splice, we check shrinkage, you know, to make sure that the perforations are aligned so that they wouldn't, because the claw and the projector might come in and, you know, misalign, it might be misaligned with the actual perforation and tear the film. So we're very conservative, their shrinkage gauges. Um, online um, you basically can compare it with like a fresh piece of leader to see if they line up or not um, the projectors need to be clean they need to be open so no auto loading projectors i mean there's a lot of like little things that you have to consider to minimize the risk um, i just don't take a i don't take the risk honestly it's like if something's curling or it smells bad, you know, red flag. If it's just if it doesn't look good, don't risk it, basically. Um, and just yeah, just take care. We also have um, I don't know if it's on HomeMovieDay.com, and now that I'm thinking about it, probably should add it. But I have a disclaimer um, that I always post, just telling people that you know film is fragile. We're taking you know our best you know taking best care not to damage anything. But of course we aren't liable if something were to happen. So we do have a disclaimer. We have everyone sign off on that disclaimer. So when people bring in their films, they sign a permission form saying that, you know, they acknowledge this risk. Um, and that also serves as like a documentation of the drop off, you know, basically saying I'm giving your films and then we'll get them back at the end of the day. Um, so there's a paper trail too. So there are like precautions, um, but that is part of the event is actually educating people like, yes, like, oh, your film is too fragile to project. Maybe it's vinegar or it's, you know, falling apart. It really should be digitized sooner rather than later. So that's that's actually part of the service of Home Movie Day is, you know, inspection. Like it's not just projection, it's inspection too and, and assessing the condition. Yeah, and is that form on I, every literally everything is on the website? So yeah. I'm yeah, so it's on the website. Yeah, yeah. and I don't know that it's not <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and and that's the thing that, um, or if there's like an updated version or something. But I'm sure that you guys can also use the you know the sort of disclaimer that we use for the memory lab because it's like the same thing. Oh. Yeah, which it's it was pro you know has something about like could even if you're impaled and think Mary pointed that out one of our partners like it covers everything who knows uh, at home movie day um, so yeah any other questions for Pamela these are great questions and some of the other ooh, home movie day events that involve alcohol um, are these independently organized, not affiliated with a library? Um, I mean, yeah, I guess that was trying to think about the ones that I have done. They have been just like uh, independent of, um, they're just, it's just um, a bunch of AV archivists who mostly work for libraries um, who then are putting it together at the Home Movie Day, but it is. Sorry? <laughs> Any questions? Uh, so yeah, so um, that's a good point because that's probably also a liability factor. Um, but I think if you did it in collaboration with a bar or like, for example, the one that we did across the street, um, it's Normals, which is a book and record shop, but then they have a uh, 
a little performance space next door, and it's BYOB. So it's sort of like, you know, you can um, very nonchalantly, you're not necessarily advertising it, but um, you're not uh, breaking any laws or anything like that. So, um, and yeah, I don't know, did that answer that question? Because um, I can't think of any that were officially moving because I know that a lot, especially art house cinemas, so you might want to look and see, there is a thing called um, the art house convergence, right? Yeah. Um, so that's like a professional organization for art houses, which a lot of times are like those old movie houses that people have renovated and they show more independent and art house, you know, and foreign films and things like that. But then they also do a lot of older movies too. Um, uh, you might want to look into your area and see if there are any of those that you could potentially partner with because a lot of times they have liquor licenses because that helps them um, with their uh, sales of their um, concessions. Um, so you could potentially do uh, just maybe maybe you get to table, like maybe there's like a library table in their grand foyer or whatever, um, and you guys can hand out stuff about your library and your memory lab. Um, I used to work at a single screen art house theater in Greenbelt that um, would would totally, uh, I think they have done home movie days there before um, and also digitization events too. So great question. Great. Okay. Well, if there's no other questions for now, I want to get um, cracking on my presentation for you guys. Um, Thank you, Pamela, so much. Yay. Awesome. Um, and if you stick around, that's great, Pamela. But if not, I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You're welcome. I'll Get stick it. around if you're fine. Okay. Yeah, of course not. Um, and yeah, I just really encourage you guys, especially our California partners, to reach out to Pamela and or the Center for Home Movies. Yay. Yay. Okay. So now I get to share my screen and open up my um, presentation for you guys, which is hiding over here. Um, so this presentation um, I put together and um, my thoughts are that you guys can use this and just plug your name in um, here and plug in any anything that you want. Obviously it's the same, same gist as uh, what um, what pa or what Sorry, Pamela. Um, what Jamie did, um, and one second, I just realized that I made Pamela presenter. I'm going to make my. Can I unmake you a presenter? Hmm. Oh well, everyone can see this, correct? Sure. Pamela, can you see this? Yes. Okay. Great. Okay, so um, starting over. So as uh, with Jamie's presentations that she gave before our first webinar, um, you know, I wanna just make it everything that you can kind of plug in for yourself. Um, so I'm gonna give you guys these PowerPoints. They're gonna have notes, copious notes that to go along with them um, that you guys can use and change according to how you wanna, you know, make it work with your community. Um, but I thought it would be really fun um, for you guys to do this maybe in September to gear up for Home Movie Day coming up in October, or you could do it in October, um, whatever you feel comfortable with, you don't even have to use it. Um, but I just think that it will help uh, with your community in um, especially answering some questions that I think you guys are gonna get a lot about film and it's a nice like, um, oh, we can't do scanning of film in the memory lab, but here's what we do do. You know, here's what we can do for you. Um, we can help you. We do give this class um, where we tell you you can um, at least preserve, preserve your originals. Um, and then we talk more about where you can pick a, you know, where you can pick a vendor, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's where I think that this will be, this could be a very helpful presentation for you um, in dealing with uh, home movies and, and films specifically. 
So I'm going to go through the presentation. Um, oh, and the other thing that I want to let you know uh, is that, as you guys remember, at boot camp we showed you our two CCPL has these two um, zines, so those little like magazines about preservation. We call them Maximum Preservation 1 and 2. And we are making a third one on home movie preservation. And that is basically going going to be something that you can go and hand out at this um, at a home movie day um, or at your uh, class that you have for home movies. And it's basically going to cover bullet points very very uh, much more simply the information that we're gonna that I'm gonna share with you guys today. So um, I'm basically going to uh, go through this and just let you guys know. Um, uh, I'll kind of pretend like you guys are my uh, patrons, but I'm also going to kind of run through it pretty quickly so that we have time for questions. So this is a slide that I like to introduce um, uh, everyone kind of to uh, the idea that um, that home movies um, will likely hold the most importance to um, family members. And of course, on your first slide, you want to introduce yourself and um, to, your, to everyone um, and let them know uh, your contact info and what, what you do. This is th letting them know that their home movies are important. If no one um, currently takes an interest in your personal documents, a future fa uh, family member most likely will or could. Um, your home movies are also, you know, important historical materials. They not only document your family, um, but then they also document the tra traditions, values, and landscapes of a place and its people. Many people are surprised to learn that their home movies can hold great interest for the wider public, including local historians, international scholars, artists, and all types, even more than that. Um, for example, you see here, this uh, movie belonged to a family, um, and it not only included this uh, newborn baby um, that they had, uh, but there was also a wedding reception that was held in the 1950s. And once I talked to the family and uh, we learned uh, where it, that um, reception was filmed, we realized that we had uh, footage of a famous Baltimore jazz venue um, in the before it became a famous Baltimore jazz venue in the 1960s and 70s and 80s. Um, so this was before before that, which is really rare and really unique, and was really really exciting. Um, and they were really excited to see their baby, you know, as a baby. Um, so it was everyone was happy all around. So. Um, you know, we're going to take you through these main areas of preserving your home movies. The first one is identification, where you need to identify the um, who, what, where, when, and how of uh, how many items, how many items make up your family home movie collections. So you need to make a list and check it twice. Um, and uh, identification of the content is the first challenge in home movies. Inheritors of films typically find themselves with a large quantity of unlabeled film or video, and they usually don't have the uh, equipment to watch them. They don't have the expertise to operate the machines. And this is where you can ask them who has home movies, that, but they don't have the playback equipment, you know, um, and haven't seen them in years or don't know what is on them, and they all raise their hand. Um, you're in the right place. So. Rather than having the entire collection, you know, transferred or digitized, which would be a significant expense, um, it would be, you know, best to find a way of, of previewing the materials or the knowing what the content is um, so you can identify the most significant uh, and arrive at a plan um, for your access and preservation of, of what you need. Um, so, with that, this is my grandfather, by the way. I was really excited when I found this uh, photo of him taking our home movies. I was like, this is so meta. Um, so anyway, if you know the content, then you can better prioritize, uh, as I mentioned, you know, what you preserve first. Um, resources are limited. Um, prioritization is the key in all of this, um, in, in all of home movie uh, preservation, in all of preservation, actually. 
Um, but so we'll, we'll hit prioritization a lot. So once you know your content, you can make priorities from there. Um, the second challenge in identification is finding the format of uh, your home movies. Um, for example, is it film or is it video? How can you tell which is which? Um, you know, you, do you need to know everything about that um, 16 millimeter film? Not necessarily. You just need to be able to know that it is 16 millimeter film. Um, you need to know what type of video. So that's going to help you understand what kind of playback material uh, or equipment you'll need um, and next steps. And you can get all kinds of, you can get quotes from vendors and things like that. But you need to know what you have. So we're going to start off with um, your typical film home movie formats. Um, and I have the four here that we'll, we're going to be talking about today. And I still need to clean up some of these. I haven't used Photoshop in a while, so I can see where I need to clean up some of these images. I'll, I'll make it real pretty, guys, I promise. Um, so uh, image, images on film, you basically just have to I mean, you won't get the full effect, but you get to hold it up to the light and you can actually see something um, on your film. As, as opposed to that one black one there, there isn't actually anything on it. Um, so your eyes are not deceiving you. Um, but so um, these are the main players, as I, as I mentioned, in, in uh, home movie film format. There are others, but we, since we only have a limited amount of time, we're going to talk about the ones that you're most likely going to find in your collection. Um, so, starting off, we'll start with 16 millimeter motion picture film. Uh, and 16 millimeter is called that because it is 16 millimeter wide. It's been around since 1923 um, for home movies, and people are still shooting on it today. But it is very costly. It has been very costly and expensive. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, it, especially in the 20s and 30s, it, and it, it was much more um, wealthy, well-to-do people. The only reason why we had it for my family, uh, 60 millimeter, was because my grandfather was a football coach, and so he had the cameras for his work because he had to um, film the football teams. So he was able to buy his own film and use his work cameras to take some home movies uh, on beautiful 60 millimeter. Um, but you can get sound and silent uh, pictures on these, and you can see here on the left is 16 millimeter sound, and then 16 millimeter silent, which we call one single perf or single perforations, those holes on the side, or double perf, um, double perforations. And you can also get uh, black and white and color film. So just to show a bit more of a close up of those two. You can see um, single perp on the left, and you can see the soundtrack um, there, and the single line of, of perforation hold that moves the camera or the film through the camera or projector. And then on the right, we have um, a 16 millimeter silent uh, home movie. Next up, we have eight millimeter motion picture film, and eight millimeter meter is eight millimeters wide. Basically, um, what they did was they split 16 millimeter in half and they got eight millimeter. And that came around the scene around the 1932-ish. And it stuck around until about um, the 1980s. Um, I mean, that's more of a wiggly kind of when it, they were still manufacturing it, but um, a lot of times people moved to other formats. Um, so uh, it was more costly, but not quite as, as expensive as 16 millimeter. Um, and it was, there was no soundtrack, um, but you could have black and white, or you can also have color. Uh, and here I wanted to just show the, uh, and compare. So there's your 16 millimeter silent film on the one side. Um, so, so I wanted you to see the size of the perforations. Um, and you can see that they're the same size um, for 60 millimeter as they are for eight millimeter, regular eight millimeter film. So you can see that they basically just split it in half um, and the perforations are still the same size. And that is important because that's how you'll be able to tell um, whether you have super eight millimeter or eight millimeter film. So eight millimeter and super eight millimeter are both eight millimeters wide, 
But in 1965, they made Super 8 in order, um, and they made those perforation holes smaller so that you could fit potentially a soundtrack on the side. Um, I love their soundtracks. Um, and then also you could have more um, space for an image. So you could have a slightly higher quality image. So this was less costly um, than 60 millimeter or regular 8 millimeter. And you could get sound or silent, and you could have black and white or color. And they still make Super 8 um, to this day. People still shoot on it. I wanted to show you um, the comparison between Super 8 and with the soundtrack um, on the left, and then the 8 millimeter that we looked at before, that the perforations are much smaller. Um, and then you get more space for uh, your image and more space for potential. So moving to your video, once again, we're only going to cover the typical home movie formats. Um, and that, uh, those could be, you could have a lot more, um, and actually this is, we might end up at adding Betamax to this, you guys, but Betamax is not very popular. Um, but if you guys tend to find to have a lot of people coming in asking for Betamax, we'll talk. So, um, let's start off with our first format, and that is VHS. Um, VHS is uh, the basically video is different than film because you really need that playback deck to even know what you might have because you can't hold video up to the light um, and uh, see anything that it won't tell you anything about its content and I really recommend not to touch the um, videotape at all uh, because it's, all of these formats are inside of a protective cartridge um, so so that you don't get your um, fingerprints and dirt and oils on um, the sensitive magnetic tape inside. So VHS came around 1976, um, and I believe they stopped making around 2008 is really when the heyday died. Um, although they still manufactured uh, VCRs until 2016. So you, it's sound and color. It's a lower resolution, and um, we're not going to go very much into this, but just know that it is anal an analog signal um, that is recorded onto it. Um, so here uh, is another example of what a VHS looks like. Um, and you can, uh, with a lot of these, uh, you'll know by the size, and there are logos. Um, and you can see the logo. I have a logo there. Um, and then um, typically the logos are sort of like embossed in the plastic um, somewhere on the front um, of your of your format. So I just wanted to put here your typical stuff that you guys might recognize, which has your commercial home movies that you bought. And then on the right is a totally unlabeled blank. Who knows? Well, don't know if it's blank. Don't know if it has precious home movies on it. Um, so you could have either or for your VHS. And then came, uh, in 1982, VHS-C, which still has the same um, width of magnetic tape inside and videotape inside, and still sound and color, low resolution, and analog signal. But it's a smaller, it's a much smaller cassette. Um, and this was in order to make it much more portable. So you'll find a lot of, so people could have those camcorders and just very easily move about um, and film or video their, uh, you know, video the birthdays, et cetera, outdoor events. Um, and so here I have on the left, you'll see the, the VHSC um, tape. And then on the right, I have the VHSC tape inside of the cartridge that um, you will place, that you place the tape inside of so that it can play in a regular VHS deck. Um, so you, that that cartridge, basically, once you have it in there, it looks like a regular VHS. So don't get, you could potentially get confused. Um, but if you see anything that looks like that cartridge or says cassette adapter or cartridge, um, then uh, and looks more like this than your normal um, VHS that doesn't have that huge window in it, um, then you'll know it could be a VHS. So uh, 
Another very popular home movie format um, is video H. So this is part of the eight millimeter video family, um, which I know can get very confusing, but we, with uh, eight millimeter film, um, but this is very different and uh, the time frame was very different. So this is 1984 through to approximately the 1990s, um, lower resolution and analog signal. Um, and I see here, I forgot to put the video H uh, image that I made, but I have it, so I just need to put that in there. Um, and basically, the uh, video H family, once again, it's just about the size of the tape. So, um, and then also, you have to uh, look at the logo, um, which we will look at the, this one typically has that um, red eight or like a red block, red um, square that has like an H um, outline in it. So you see both of those there. So, and these are more the size of um, around, it's smaller like VHS-C uh, and thinner than the VHS-C because it's eight millimeter video. So it made it compact yet again. Um, so the next format um, that's still part of the same family, eight millimeter video, but is a little bit higher resolution is high H. And this came around a few years after regular eight, so 1989 through, people used through the 1990s. Probably some people still used it into the 2000s, um, but I just wanted to go with the most popular uh, time frame. And as I said, it's a little bit better resolution, but still analog information. And um, here is your logo that'll help you help you know um, that you could potentially have high H uh, tape. But this can get very confusing, unfortunately. And it's the same size as video eight. So you really have to look at those um, logos. But then also it can uh, get very confusing because digital eight came next in 1999. Um, people still use it, uh, and it, but it, so it's basically mid-level resolution, like Hi8, still part of that family of videos, tapes, but it records digital information instead of an instead of analog information. Um, so that's the main difference. Um, and uh, basically, what they did was they just were able to take Hi8 tapes and figure out how to record digital information onto them. So unfortunately. Like this tape here, um, this is uh, on the left is where it's in its wrapper, where it does say digital age. But then you can see it also says high eight, so you can use it on either, you can use it in a digital eight camera or a high eight camera and record either one. And then if you just look at the tape on the right, it just looks like high eight. Um, so it, but if you recorded it on a digital eight camera, then you, that would actually be digital information. Um, so I just want to point that out that it, if you see something that is a high eight that typically has that um, metal uh, on it, a lot of times that is an indicator that um, that you might have something that could be recorded um, digitally. So hopefully whoever uh, recorded them wrote or put a label on it that says digital eight, because when you open the tape up, it does give you these little stickers. You can just put it right on there, like this is actually digital eight. Um, but you could also have this, uh, or the logo, which um, I didn't, should be right here, but it says VHSC, so I'll get that to you guys. Um, lastly, the main uh, format that you guys will see is Mini DV, and this is even smaller with the tape, came around 1995. Um, it's a middle level, you can have a little bit higher resolution than digital eight. Um, but it definitely has its own problems um, and it records digital information. So here are the mini DVI, I have a feeling you guys have probably seen some before, but they are much smaller. Um, so I wanna talk about prioritization. If you know the content and format, um, then you can better prioritize uh, what you preserve first. Because of the resources being limited, et cetera, um, for example, I really recommend that you preserve video before film. That this is more me speaking at the Center for Home Movies, but um, because magnetic tape uh, degrades uh, and was not made to last, 
Um, the playback machines are, are no longer manufactured, um, but and also, you know, based it off of a condition assessment. So uh, if you have, um, which we will talk more about in a second, but, um, you know, unless you have films that really need help um, and work, then I really recommend that you digitize your video before your so the second part is assessing, um, and this is where we rate the condition of your collection. Um, and you have to think about the degradation of the object that just happens naturally from aging, and then damage that happens from viewing and damage from storage. So those are the main things that you have to look at, and each one can be slightly different. So for film, the main degradation that you see is vinegar syndrome, and you'll see some shrinking, warping of the film, and then basic brittleness. Um, and I wanted to show, here is an example of a film that has vinegar syndrome that's like shrinking, um, but you can also see some warping as well. Um, and it just basically is starting to twist and turn. Um, and basically the idea, you'll also smell uh, very, it'll smell very vinegary, like a salad or salt and vinegar chips. Um, and it'll just keep getting worse and worse. So you want to keep that, those stinky films away from your other films because it, it is like a cold, they will catch it. Um, so you want to kind of bag them up and make and put those on the top of your priority list. For video, the main um, indicator of a thing called sticky shed syndrome uh, that you will see um, is screeching noises during the playback. Um, during when you pop it into the VCR, uh, lots of snow, or they're called dropouts um, during playback. So, um, for example, if you saw something like this, but even worse than this, this is a normal video dropout. Uh, but, it, it, you know, if you had seen it, uh, you can kind of like see your basic image and then it disappears after a few seconds because of all of this interference. And, or if you hear screeching and things like that, then stop your video deck and uh, you need to um, take it to a uh, So both film and video um, can suffer from mold and that just, you know what mold looks like on most things. So unfortunately it can happen to your film and video, mostly on the outside. You don't want to breathe that in, just bag it and uh, put it on the top of your priority list. Um, Film and video can suffer from poor storage, and then um, projecting films and playing back your videos can damage them, as we've already discussed, um, especially if things have decayed and degraded, or if your machine hasn't been serviced, or, or if you don't know how to use your machine very well, um, those, those can damage. Uh, but how do you have safe view viewing? Uh, there's home movie day events. This year uh, it is on October 20th, but there could be other days. Home Movie Day comes once a year, but sometimes more than that. The people who organize it can help you um, with your film preservation, so potentially reach out to them uh, at the Center for Home Movies. Um, and depending on the you could actually uh, get it digitized professionally, or you could digitize it at a memory lab at a public library. Um, where you could have access to uh, equipment. You can also potentially reach out to a local regional library or archive to help. Um, and you can search for them. Um, you can search for local uh, archives that collect home movies um, through the Center for Home Movies. There's an advanced search. Um, and then uh, the Memory Lab, we also have resources where you can look up regional audiovisual um, archives. So this is an example of what can happen if you uh, don't uh, project your film properly. So this is a, a, where it got, film got stuck or someone paused it, left it, left the film. Um, sitting in the projector and it burned a hole, the light bulb burned a hole through the frame. This is one example of what can happen, but there are many others. So if you know the condition, you can better prioritize, um, and then you can move, uh, knowing what you have, what is recorded on what condition it's in, then you can uh, move to proper storage, which is important to keep your original safe. So um, if you properly store your films, uh, they can last a really long time. 
So video can also degrade in bad storage, but it doesn't net last nearly as long as film. So at this stage, you know, properly store everything, um, but then move certain items to the next stage of digitization and others could potentially just stay in storage. So keep your originals. Uh, we keep saying this, but you know, even if you make digital copies, um, it's really recommended that you save your originals, especially your most cherished home movies. Copies are usually lower quality and on formats that also degrade. Um, a lot of people transferred their beautiful 16 millimeter film to VHS, like my family, uh, in the 80s and 90s. And unfortunately, a lot of those vendors kept the film. And so all these families have, including my family, all that they have are those VHS copies, which are much, much lower quality. So keep your originals. Um, best practices for storage are cool and dry, no direct sunlight, off the floor. So basically, ideally would actually not be an attic or a basement, but more like a closet on a shelf. And you could have breathable containers, um, just something that's uh, not plastic bags, basically and not stacking too many on top of the other. Store your films flat and video vertically like books, so on, on their end. So now that you know what you have and what it's recorded on, you know what condition it's in and you've properly stored the originals, you can move the stuff higher on your priority list to digitization. There are definite pros and cons to this. Um, watching digital files for the pros uh, won't damage your original um, your original films. You can watch those digital files as many times, won't hurt that original. Um, you can make multiple copies of those digital files and share without losing uh, quality um, in your image. And then you can access them really easily, you can edit them really easily, um, edit out those hours of uh, panning shots or whatever. But then unfortunately, there's also downsides. So uh, digital files can degrade and be lost, you need to make sure you have multiple copies and multiple options. So, you know, one copy at mom's house, one at your Uncle Bob's house, one at your house. Um, and you can um, potentially learn more about uh, digital preservation from the Center for Home Movies. Um, and then, most importantly, it can get expensive. You get what you pay for with transfer companies. Um, higher quality and safety will cost you more money. And if your items have decayed, um, then it will cost you more money, um, or if your film is dirty, it will cost you more money to clean it, etc. So Center for Home Movies has this great um, resource uh, where you they have a list of questions that you should ask a vendor um, before you send your home movies to them for them to digitize. Uh, so the some examples of that are: Does the price um, include cleaning and repair of my films before transfer? What method of cleaning do you use? What kind of equipment do you use? For and if they don't want to tell you or don't know or can't put you in touch with someone that does, chances are they don't know what they're doing. Um, so this is why this list is really important. Um, and as a, as a blanket statement, I just want to say this list, this list here of vendors and transfer houses are not necessarily being recommended, but they are a good place to start. Um, the Center for Home Movie list basically is a list of transfer houses that at least return your originals and have answered a certain amount of questions, but you still need to make them answer all those questions above. Um, and so these are just places that you can start to find vendors in your region. Also, we of course want to mention that we have a memory lab at our public library that is free, but you have to do the work. It takes time, energy, it creates large files. Um, but it's also lower resolution um, than what an archive like the Library of Congress might be doing um, because those would be huge and you wouldn't be able to even play those on your computer. Um, but unfortunately, you know, there isn't an option also for um, safe, relatively affordable, and easy to use motion picture film digitization stations for us to include in these memory labs. So you can only digitize uh, your video cassette format. And this is where you guys can say exactly what format you can digitize. Um, but uh, hopefully someday this type of technology might be built uh, and we would potentially uh, add that to the memory lab network model. 
So keep your eyes peeled also for um, free digital preservation classes that we'll be teaching at the library to help you um, take care of your recently created digital files. Lastly, it's really, really important to document these. Think of the children. Um, think about the future generations who might see these uh, home movies. So include people's names, events, place names, street addresses, who's filming, everything. Um, try to describe for someone who's not part of your family and has never seen the movie before. Include facts and stories um, about everything, all the people, the places, traditions, rituals, anything related to it. And you, how can you record this? You can write it down on paper. Or if you want, you can you know write it down in a, in a basic text file on your laptop. You can record it on your phone. Every, almost every smartphone, you can record audio. Um, so just record it uh, as an audio file that will accompany um, your home movie. Uh, and potentially maybe sync it up with the screen, capturing it during a screening of the film, sort of like director's commentary, um, but with potentially people who know who everyone is in the movie. Um, and maybe record afterwards as well to include other um, memories that the um, film brings up for people who were involved in making them and being them, or do all three of these things. So lastly, it's important to come up with a living will for if you have home movies so they aren't lost after, after you are gone and people don't just throw them out. Um, let's, if, it's their, if they're important to you, let people know what you want, who you want them to go to, um, and maybe potentially look at um, donating them to a local archive or library. So I just want to say, um, you know, remembering this uh, family that you saw in the beginning, you know, this is their couple with their baby daughter. And um, this is them recently, last year, the couple in the front there, and that's their baby daughter in the back. And we were lucky enough to sit down and record on my smartphone um, them reliving their wedding and all the different places and who everyone was. Um, and it was just a really fun time. It put everyone in a really great mood. The daughter said the, the parents were cranky beforehand and then afterwards they were just in, they were just all lovey-dovey and so happy. Um, but, and then unfortunately the wife passed away only a few months after we recorded that. So we were able to have this amazing gift you know, about for the general public and people to learn more about their home movies, which hold a lot of great regional content, but then it was also a real beautiful gift to have for the family as well. So for, for further resources um, on preserving your home movies and finding a home movie day near you, check out Center for Home Movies. And to learn more about the DCPL Memory Lab Network and to find a memory lab near you, go to this dclibrary.org labs memory lab. So thank you all so much, and here's my contact information, and let me know if you have any questions. Okay, so that went longer than I had hoped, but hey, we have two minutes um, for uh, any questions that people might have about giving this, um, what I should, because this is also a network, so this is what I thought might be good to share. Um, with your communities, but if you guys have any thoughts about maybe what I should add, like I said, if you guys think that we should add Betamax, I will, but it wasn't a super popular format. Um, do you guys think that you will um, teach this class? Anyone? If no, do you feel like you're, do you feel like you are not, like, are you worried, what, what in particular are you worried about covering, maybe? Just too much information for one day? <laughs> I think we will in LA, but down the road after we get the right equipment. Right. Yes, definitely. I think that this will make much more sense doing this after you have your memory lab up and running. Absolutely. Yeah, that would be better. Yeah, but I wanted to give this um, to you guys now 
first and foremost because it really is good to start planning. Uh, I should probably listen to my own advice, but it's very good to start planning and reaching out to um, home movie, you know, take a look, find out if there's any home movie days near you and start reaching out to those people and, and maybe think about how you can at least, even if you just go there and put out your little, like do some sort of, put your panel cards there of your memory lab um, marketing materials. I feel like I saw some sort of. We will probably do a slightly abbreviated, abbreviated version of this if we do a home movie day. Okay, cool. Plug ball. Um, yeah, and I think that that's, uh, you know, as you guys take things out, add things that you might think are relevant, let us know and you can share with us your versions and then we can like see what works and what doesn't. Um, and even if you give it and people and it doesn't work, you know, try and evaluate and see why, why not. Mm -hmm. 